major headline around the league tonight. The Los Angeles Lakers and Miami Heat have agreed to a trade that will send Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest big men of all time, to sunny South Florida. Remember this, I'm going to bring a championship to Miami, I promise. If you look at the team that we have on paper, we should have won 79-3. The Eastern Conference champions, the Miami Heat. And the Miami Heat are champions of the basketball world! I came to Miami because of this young fella right here. I knew he was a special player. You play with Penny. Play with Kobe. Go to Miami, play with D-Wade. Um, and you got a championship there, too. How special was that one to win? It was special because I knew I was getting older. I was starting to starting to lose a little bit, and Pat Riley was awesome. He, he was awesome. Uh, D Wade was awesome, and you know, when I got there with D Wade, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm older. I'm tired. It's your team, D Wade. First thing I did with D Wade, we went to a restaurant. And I told him all the stuff that happened bad with me and Kobe, and I said, I'm telling you this, D Wade, because this could never happen between us. I said, tomorrow when I go to the press conference, it's your team. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be your consultant. I'm going to be your consigliere. You're the godfather. I'm the top lawyer. We work together. And we did. And, you know, he was, he was great. And if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have that championship because I really didn't have a Shaq-style finals. Uh, Dallas Mavericks did a good job of fronting and backing and double and triple team, but... I was always taught to utilize my teammates. Antoine stepped up, Posey stepped up, UD stepped up, Alonzo stepped up defensively. When we were down 0-2, we came back and we had a we had a fiery team meet. We were just pointing pointing each other out. I'm coming at Gary, Gary coming at me, UD. Like it was just, you know, and we haven't had that. So we finally had that, you know, you know, it was my way of letting the guys... After just two games go. of the finals. Yeah, two games in the finals. We, we're at practice, we, we're at practice, and then we call a team meeting, we go at it. What you going to do? What you going to do? You need to do this, you need to do that. So In the NBA finals, in the team NBA meeting, finals, most people laugh yeah. at that in the middle of the season yeah. when they say, oh, great, a team meeting. Oh, uh, what's that going to do? And you're, yeah. here you're down 2-0. Down 2-0, we call a team meeting, and we're just, we're just jumping on each other. Boom, boom, boom. I let that go on for about 30 minutes, and I said, okay, what are we going to do now? And then we figure out a strategy, you know, because we, we knew that we could beat them. We knew we, we, we just had to take one game at a time. So our focus was to take one game at a time. And Pat Riley had this big bowl in the middle of the floor, and he had a lot of cards. He put stuff in every day he wouldn't let us see. But he would always pull one card out and say 15 strong. And he was right. And, you know, being that he, he was there before and he won the championship, the guys believed him. I believed him because, you know, it took coaches like that to get me to, to play at that next level. Uh, you, you know, no disrespect to all my other coaches, but if I'm playing for a guy that's been there before, I know he knows what he's talking about. I'm going to follow him to the end. So, you know, we rallied together, and, you know, we go up 3-2, and then Pat Riley comes in pissed off. We ain't practicing today. We go in here tomorrow, and you better bring one suit. When you get to the airport tomorrow at 12 o'clock, I'm checking. If you ain't got one suit, your ass ain't coming on the plane. So when we got to the airport, he's checking people back, and we actually had to bring one suit. True story. True story. So we get to the airport, he's checking everybody's back to see if we had one, one suit. Because he's like, we're up 3-2, we're going on that floor, we're going to end it. There ain't going to be no game seven. And that's what everybody had to think about. And He's probably one of the greatest motivators. Him and Dale Brown, they, they, you know, when they tell stories before a game, you just want to go out and kill people, Ernie. Is there part of you, because I know you're into leadership, that taps into that and says, boy, that's really, it that's does. good. Yeah, I can use that later in life. I, it did. And, you know, rap, <clears throat> Pat Riley and Dale Brown are similar guys. They they teach never give up. You know, I I, I can remember a game, we, we, we weren't playing well, and Pat Riley comes in. You guys, mine are, are, aren't in it. He comes in with a big bucket of water. He, it's, it's all up here. You can do anything you want. I'm going to put my head in that bucket for three minutes. And everybody's sitting there like, yeah, the record is a minute 30. Like, people that go scuba dive a minute 30, maybe two. And he did it for three minutes. Oh, come on. Three minutes. <laughs> Ernie, oh, he stuck his hair in Ask him next time you see him. He stuck with his hair. With his hair? He put yes. his hair under yes. there, yes. too? Yes, he stuck it. I don't know which part of that minutes. is more amazing. I'm telling you, he did it. So, like, the guy's, like, looking at him like, you know what? 
he's right. So like his his speeches and his stories, and you know, I always tell people, that's what always took me to the next level. Not training, not going out and being in the gym three hours, conversations. So those kind of things, whether it's Sarge, or whether it's Dale Brown, or Phil and his Zen, or or Pat Riley, those were the kind of things that gave you that oomph that you needed? Yes, because growing up, it took a disciplinarian to make me who I am. It took a disciplinarian for me to stop being a follower and learn to be a leader. I, used to, I, was, I was a medium level juvenile delinquent. I used to come home and get in trouble with my followers, you say, gotta stop being a follower, man. I know your friends wanted to steal the car and you jumped in the car with them. Now everybody's in trouble. You gotta stop that. You gotta learn how to be a leader. So, you know, once I mastered that and then, you know, it took, you know, it took that type of guy to get me to always go to that next level. Dale Brown was like that. You know, he had a rule that if you miss class, you'll run. I'm a junior, I'm all American. I'm on the cover of Sports Illustrated. I might be going pro at the end of this year. I might not. I missed class one day. So I'm, I'm laying, I'm sleeping and there's a white hand on my chest. I'm so tired, and, you know, guys that went out the night before, and I wake up, and I actually think I'm dead, and I'm like, God? Because, like, I see a white hand on my chest, and, like, and, and the crazy thing is, I got three locks on my door. How the hell did this guy get in my room? <laughs> so he got his hand on my chest, and I'm like, God? He said, no, it's me. Get your ass to the track. At 6 a.m., so he ran me, I, 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 ran about, I ran about 15 laps, Ernie, three miles, so we, we, we run, he stop, he let you catch your breath, and, sh and I never miss class again. Never miss class again. So like, it, it, it took like that, that, that disciplinary and father-like figure to get me to perform at the next level. Password. Don't fake the funk on a nasty dunk. At some point in your career, when you saw the trajectory of your career, I you did. had to think at some point, you know what? This is going to wind up in the Hall of Fame. I only got confirmation when I heard other people say it. I knew what I had to do. Uh, if you can remember, my first commercial was Don't Fake the Funk on the Nasty Dunk. And it was <laughs> Kareem, it was Will Chamberlain, it was Bill Russell, and it was Bill Walton. And I designed that commercial to, to keep me motivated and say, you know what? They're going to compare you to these guys. You got to play similar to these guys or better to these guys if you want to reach the pinnacle to where these guys reach. So I know I had big shoes to fill. I knew I had big expectations. And I knew if I could just come in and, you know, play my own style, my own brand of basketball, that possibly I can get there. Uh, if I didn't have any championships, to answer your question, no. Like, everybody would say, oh, he's good, he's doing this, doing that, but he doesn't have any championships. But now that I have four championships and I dominate the way I did, I can say, yes, I truly believe I am all of him. To not have him listening to you at Springfield yes. making that speech. You know, a guy asked me the other day, are you happy about the Hall of Fame? And I said, yeah. And he said, you don't have a smile on your face. And this was, this was his dream as well as my dream. He's my stepfather, even though I don't believe in the term stepfather. But when he started teaching me basketball, he always preached three names. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Will Chamberlain, and Bill Russell. He told me everything about those guys. And he was like, if, he, you know, he kept saying, if you listen to me, if you listen to me, I can make you as good as those guys. Like, I never wanted to be those guys. I wanted to be Dr. J. But once I became seven foot, I was like, you know, I got to be like these guys. And he would just preach their name all the time. And then... When I heard other people say Shaq is similar to these guys, I was like, you know what? All that stuff he was teaching me was correct. Now let me start tuning up. So, you know, let me start tuning up. A quote that my father told me, you know, he called me NBA. I was having a terrible game. He said, uh, what's wrong, pressure? I said a little bit. He said, when you come home, come see me. So I uh, came home and we took a ride and we saw a homeless family on the curve. We talked to him, we had a conversation with him. You know, we tried to give him some money, took him to Walmart, got him some clothes, and on, on the way back, he said, that's pressure. Mm -hmm. Not knowing where your next meals come from. So you make a lot of money playing this game. You don't, don't, don't ever say that word pressure to me again. 
and I changed my life and I changed the way I play. Because you think about Ernie, you know, we, we, we make a good living, guarantee contracts, it ain't no pressure. You just go out, do your job, and perform.